Tonight, I spy. We all know we're being watched in many different ways. So, is this the only way to protect our privacy? Hello and welcome to Insight. I'm Jenny Brocky. On the screen behind me, you'll see our audience arriving for tonight's forum. They probably didn't realise they were being recorded, but they didn't have much of a choice. Every day across the country, thousands of closed-circuit television cameras capture our movements. And there's nothing much we can do about it. CCTV cameras have, of course, become important for security and led to many arrests and prosecutions. But they're not the only way that our movements are now being tracked. Our mobile phones, personal computers, credit and loyalty cards, even e-tags on our cars all help to paint a picture of who we are and what we're up to. So where is all this information going and where could it end up? Anna Johnson, let me start with you with that question. We give out a lot of information every day, almost without knowing it. What impact do you think it's having on our privacy? I think we are starting to lose our privacy. One issue is always whether the law can keep up with technology and uh, there's you know, new technologies developing and starting to impact on privacy in serious ways at the moment include, for example, uh, genetic information, surveillance you've already mentioned, uh, the use of smart cards that allow movements to be tracked and so on. Do you think people are aware of how much information is being gathered about them? Uh, no, one of our concerns is always the, the lack of transparency in how much um, organisations, whether it's government or, or big business, is collecting information about ourselves, um, sharing it, using it, uh, profiling and tracking movements and so on. There's not a lot of transparency and that's where um, obviously privacy laws are important to ensure some transparency and accountability. Paul McKinnon, you're a, a former Assistant Police Commissioner. Is it fair enough for people to be worried about losing their privacy, about all this information floating around? No, I don't think so. It's, um, if you go back in history, individuals have always left a trail of some sort, but it was in document form, and it took longer to compile a profile or construct a picture of a particular suspect if it was a, a criminal issue. Today it's much more quicker because the records are electronic, as has already been pointed out. Now, the correctness of that depends on if there is a legitimate forensic purpose for doing this and law enforcement and like agencies in particular are always under scrutiny to make sure that everything that is done with respect to privacy has a legitimate forensic purpose. Mm. But you're, you don't think people have reason to be concerned because of the sheer volume of information that's now available about them through things like credit cards and mobile phones well, and so on? The, as the aspect that concerns me and that's already been objected to is that is a central legitimate repository to establish a valid identity. Currently identity depends on um, commercial links like credit cards, your driver's license to buy and drive a motor vehicle, a passport to buy an airplane ticket and travel. All of these things can be fraudulently reproduced because there is no centralised valid process for any of the agencies to refer to to make sure that an individual purporting to be Joe Blow is actually Joe Blow. Well, we'll get onto that a little bit later, but I, I can see that th there are arguments for and against that, and we will get onto those in a moment. Before we do, though, Kelly McCluskey, um, you're a performance artist, and you've created a special privacy service for members of the public. Now, we saw a little bit of it earlier on. Let's have another look and talk us through what you do. Sure. Well, this is... Um uh, a body of artwork that we've done in, in numerous cities. I'm, I'm just one member of the artist group PVI. And we, we offer out um, a privacy service to members of the public um, who frequent um, public spaces that are monitored by closed circuit security cameras. And so we were interested in just repurposing uh, domestic objects such as the umbrella there that you see and we've just formed a cocoon. Um, so the, um, the passenger inside is completely blinded so they need to be guided um, by, by the team from PVI via CB radios and we navigate them to the destination of their choice. <laughs> and do many people take up the offer? Um, we have. Uh, every single time we've done it we've, we've had people that have wanted to give it a shot and see what happens and inevitably we run into um, a variety of problems. Some of them are just time constraints so a journey that would normally take five minutes takes around 45. Mm. Uh, there are other problems too aren't mm. there? I know that uh, some of the reactions that you've had to your umbrellas haven't been entirely uh, haven't been entirely friendly. Let's have a look at that. 
I'll need to know you're going to stop or not. And he's going to stop down there or not. I need to know. If you don't want to, tell me now so I know what the stand is. But I don't understand why we need a permit to walk down the street with umbrellas on our heads. I mean, at the end of the day, I'm not the politician why? behind it all. So who's that, Kelly? That's the security guard who's taken you on and said, what are you doing? Yeah, it was pretty much a uh, um, security guard in, in Sydney um, who uh, claimed that we needed some kind of a permit to be doing the activity. Um, and uh, I think our argument was that we were simply um, um, giving a, a private, uh, a, giving somebody a, the opportunity to experience, a, have a private space. And this is obviously a statement. You're saying you yeah. feel we're being watched too much. Pretty much, yeah. I think um, at the end of the day, the work kind of seeks to address how transparent our lives are becoming and how impossible it is to achieve privacy nowadays. Mm. Paul Chadwick, uh, we know we're being filmed a lot these days. At service stations we can often see ourselves when you're paying for your petrol, you can see yourself up on the camera. But where else are we being watched that we might not be aware of or that we might not know about? How widespread is the use of these cameras? Jenny, the, I mean, the discussion so far has raised an important question. Privacy has never been absolute. It just isn't. You, only permits have absolute privacy. In a technological environment with digital technology making cameras smaller and cheaper, with deeper memories, they are in more and more hands. People with a mobile phone equipped with a camera and connected to the internet are a kind of one-person TV network. Things are changing and privacy is changing in public spaces. And is, is there anything people can do about it or should they do anything about it? Is it just modern life and we should just accept it? Although there are some things that I think society has to reflect on fairly carefully. So when there's um, high dudgeon about misuse of a mobile phone camera, you should ask yourself whether you really want to criminalise people taking photographs in public places because you'll criminalise lots of tourists and proud mums and dads at the school sports. However, and this is important however from a privacy commissioner, the need for privacy is really deep. Artists have taken this theme up over the centuries, but in more recent times through films like Truman Show, uh, Enemy of the State, um, The Conversation. It artists, does these plug artists into are, something in people, doesn't it? This they're whole showing us something issue important, plugs into something. And that something. means the law must address protection of personal privacy and balance in a more precise and refined way the technologies with this deep human need. The technologies are transient, but privacy is enduring. Mm. How deep is the human need uh, amongst the people here? Jan, how do you feel about, uh, about privacy issues? Um, I, I think that we do, um, we do have a lack of privacy. I have concerns that um, we, we really are at risk of um, being accosted over the telephone, for example, because a, a list of phone numbers have been given out for, for people that are selling things. Um, I think it's very intrusive. Um, and, and do you take any measures to try to protect your privacy in that I basically don't sense? answer the telephone from five till seven because that's when those calls <laughs> are coming through. So. <laughs> oh, goodness me, that wouldn't work in my house. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work very well in our house, but uh, the, 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 I think the difficulty is that we don't have um, a choice in this. You know, we don't have a choice as to where these lists are going. Um, and I guess this is just one small area, mm, but I hadn't even thought about the... the, the being filmed coming in here, which is you know, quite a frightening thought, really. Why is it frightening? Well, th that I d was unaware that that would actually be something that was um, televised as well. And, you know, the, where was my choice that I, that would be part of, of this program as mm. well? Malcolm Crompton, g can I bring you in at this point? Uh, you were, until late last year, our Federal Privacy Commissioner. Um, how else are we being tracked that we might not be aware of? Probably the thing that we haven't canvassed quite so much yet is um, the way our location is being tracked by so many things all of the time. More and more of what we use is one way or another connected to a network. Uh, our motor car uh, is more and more often going to be uh, tracked by GPS positioning, the e-tag as we go over the um, tollway, the um, uh, when we buy anything with a credit card these days is recorded. Um, if you're going to open the fridge and it's been reading everything that's inside the fridge and sending the message back um, to a shop to restock the fridge, that's telling people about uh, what you're eating and when. So it would be a very safe assumption these days that if what you're using is electronic, it may well be telling somebody where you are and what you're doing with it.
Mm. Hank uh, Jongen from uh, Centrelink, what kind of information does Centrelink have about people? Well, we have a uh, really extensive database. At any one time, it, it usually relates to about 6.3 million of our customers. That's one third of the Australian population. We record date of birth, ch child details, the obvious things like address. But in addition to that, we also um, uh, collect information in relation to income, investments, uh, investment properties, a whole range of personal information. But I have to say that we recognise our responsibility in protecting that information and the issue of privacy is something that is engendered into all of our 27,000 staff. So who can you make that, avail that information available to? Um, it is generally only made available in the assistance, in, in, the, uh, in assisting other government agencies in administering their programs. There are protections under the Social Security Act as well as the Privacy Act. It is highly unusual for us to give out information except under strict circumstances. Do but you give information to the police, for example? Only, again, in accordance with uh, a range of laws and only for serious criminal um, offences. And who decides on what is a serious criminal offence? There, there are a small... Well, firstly, it's enshrined in the law. But secondly, uh, there are uh, a small number, of, and it's also done in accordance with privacy principles, and there are a small number of people in our national support office who actually hold the delegation to make those decisions. But you'd like, there to, be, you'd like to be able to exchange information with other government departments, as I understand it. Well, again, we do a lot of data matching with a range, particularly of federal agencies, for example, uh, the tax office where we verify uh, details of income, uh, the Department of Immigration, uh, the child support agency where there are often issues of custody, uh, details of maintenance, payments, etc. That's information that we collect for the administration of the Social Security Act and it's aimed at protecting taxpayers' money. Brian Richards, you're with the Health Department and you're currently devising a system to coordinate all our health information, all the information about us in relation to our health and, and the services we use and so on. Uh, what sort of information do you have on us at the moment? Uh, <coughs> the Australian Government uh, has an agency called the Health Insurance Commission, which was, has been in existence for over 30 years, which administers key national government programs such as Medicare, Pharmaceutical Benefits Scheme, Australian Organ Donor Register, the Australian Childhood Immunisation Register. The Health Insurance Commission collects information that is necessary to manage those functions, to make the payments, and HRC pays out more than $16 billion worth of taxpayers' money per year for pharmaceutical benefits, for Medicare benefits. It also holds information about your organ donation intention. So HRC can only hold information that it requires to conduct its business, and similar to Centrelink, HRC uh, is significantly constrained and appropriately constrained about how it can use that information. Mm, but you would like to gather a lot of health information, you know, our visits to the GP, the kind of prescriptions we have, all sorts of things together in a central, the, central system? The, the proposal is not for the government to collect the information and for the government to be able to use it, but um, my role in the Department of Health and Ageing is to facilitate an, the ability for information to be exchanged in an electronic form between the healthcare providers actually directly providing services to that patient, not, not for the government to hold the information. Okay, so they can go online and they can throw up your medical history. If you go to the GP, if you've been to see another doctor, they could go into a system that would say you've been to see the other doctor and you've got this drug or whatever. Again, only with the patient's consent. It's an mm. entirely uh, consented process. And that's what you're hoping to be able to develop, that yeah, kind of system? Be because it improves health outcomes, improves the quality of healthcare decision making, it improves the efficiency of the health system, improves patient experience. Mm. Anna Johnston, what do you think about that, about that idea of gathering information like that? The Look, we, we have a number of um, concerns or questions to raise. The first is whether the notion of the, the kind of consolidated shared health record made available to any health practitioner you might visit, um, you know, whether that's necessary, whether that's the best way to spend um, health dollars in pursuit of better health outcomes, um, whether it's going to be effective, you know, that's the kind of primary policy decision-making question to be asked of that proposal. Um, 
Another question is whether if, if a patient does consent to be on the system, and, and we're pleased to hear from, from the government, um, both state and federal governments, that it will be a consent by system, but are patients consenting for their entire health information on all their medical records to be shared with any health practitioner or can they choose one-on-one -on -one? so for example um, you know if I present to hospital in an emergency situation after a car accident it's one thing to say yes I want the hospital to understand what my drug allergies are and so on um, it's another question as to whether or not they should see that 20 years ago I was diagnosed with depression or 10 years ago I had a, an abortion or something like that um, our concern is if people don't have a choice if, if the entire, it's, you know, it's all in or all out, um, people actually start making, uh, taking action that's adverse to their health in order to protect their privacy and that starts to actually undermine both, you know, both privacy and public health. Mm. And can you give us an example, another example of the kind of situation you could imagine where somebody would be concerned about all their health information being gathered in one place? Yeah, absolutely. There's a, there's a lot of, I mean, people are extremely sensitive about their health information. Um, when I was in the New South Wales Privacy Commissioner's Office, the, the misuse and disclosure of health information was the number one uh, source of complaints or trigger of complaints. Um, there's all sorts of things that people might feel comfortable sharing with their GP but may not even want their spouse or their neighbour, let alone their employer or the government knowing about whether it's, as I said, a, a termination, a miscarriage, um, treatment for incontinence, treatment for impotence. There's all sorts of health issues that are particularly sensitive um, to people. Anyone else worried about this idea of their health information being in a central data bank? Yes, up the back there. Yeah, I just, I've just got a question about insurance. Does it affect your ability to have some kind of life insurance if people know that you've had a history or an illness that, um, you know, are you suddenly going to have to pay more premium than somebody who um, doesn't have that illness? Th that implies that you're hiding it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which is an interesting point. Um, and, and fraud detection, I suppose, or, or all those kinds of things are part of this picture, aren't they, Brian? That yeah. These are all uh, very important issues that are being taken into account in designing any system of electronic uh, sharing of sensitive health information. The fundamental driving principle behind the development of electronic health records in Australia is the maintenance of the consumer's autonomy and the control by the consumer over access to and storage of their own information. So uh, the issues that have been raised by members of the audience I think are real important issues that are being taken very seriously in the design. Because it's a real big brother fear, this idea that you know, suddenly somebody knows absolutely everything about you and you get it spat back at you in a way that you don't like or don't want. I think, I think there's a common misconception that there is going to be a database that holds everything about your health care. Um, I think it's important to draw a distinction between an electronic clinical record, which is the way in which your individual health service provider chooses to manage their information about you, the way and they keep it, for example, if you see your GP or if you've been to the hospital, the storage of information currently is often on pieces of paper, which means good patient care and good clinical decisions are very often very difficult because you can't bring find the information that you need to make a decision. Malcolm, what do you think about this? So we're hearing two sides of this argument in, in the sense that the argument for the betterment of healthcare, the betterment of treatment of patients, a, a more efficient system. How does that stack up against the issues of privacy from your perspective? The, the first thing I would say in response is that I am immensely confident that we can find ways of achieving the kinds of benefits that people like uh, Brian and others have described while also managing the kind of risks that I think the the people in the audience and, and the other participants have, I think, so quite accurately defined. Um, and it's going to take a lot of discussion around Australia over the next couple of years uh, to work through where we, where we want to be with, with those kinds of balances, and that's the real value of the television debate that we're having right now. But uh, some of it revolves around the way you build the law, and some of it revolves around the way you build the technologies to do it, and some of it revolves around almost a personal privacy hygiene, the way you conduct your life and, and how you let information out. But the risks can be enormous. There's, a, what there's personal, very well known what evidence. What is personal from privacy hygiene, Malcolm? <laughs> That's an interesting <laughs> idea. What does that mean? If somebody asks you for a piece of information and you think it's a bit doubtful that they really need it, ask them why they're asking for it. Um, take a very close look at the next form you fill out on a website and look at the lines that have got asterisks and are compulsory lines to fill out 
and think about all of the other lines that are only voluntary to fill out and if you don't want to fill them out, don't fill them out. Um, do get your credit record delivered to you once a year so that you can check that it hasn't gone wrong. Um, do seek access to various records and get them corrected. Well, we all have uh, concerns about information getting out of control, of course, and uh, getting out of our control. Let's have a quick look at one vision of the future. Pizza Palace, guaranteed hot in 30 minutes or it's free. This is Mary. May I take your order? Hi. Uh, Mary, uh, I'd like to place an order. Is this Mr. Kelly? Uh, yes. I see you live at 736 Montrose Court, but you're calling from your mobile. Are you at home? I'm, I'm just leaving work, but... I we can deliver to Bob's Auto Supply. That's 175 Lincoln Avenue, yes? No, I'm on my way home. How do you know this stuff? We just got wired into the system, sir. Huh. Oh. Well, I'd just like to order a couple of your double meat special pieces. Sure thing. There will be a new $20 charge for those, sir. <laughs> what do you mean? Sir, the system shows me that your medical records indicated you have high blood pressure and extremely high cholesterol. Uh, luckily, we have a new agreement with your health fund that allows us to sell you double meat pizzas as long as you agree to waive all future claims of liability. What? Uh, you can sign the forms when we deliver, but there is an additional administration charge. Uh, the total is $67 even. $67? That includes the delivery surcharge of $15 to cover the added risk to our driver of traveling through a danger zone. I live in a danger zone. And now you do. Looks like there was another robbery on Montrose yesterday. Hmm, you could save $48 if you ordered our special Sprout Submarine combo and picked it up yourself. But I, I want double meat. Well, I'm sure you can afford the $67 then. You just bought those tickets to Hawaii. They weren't cheap, eh? Oh, but I see you checked out the budget beach bum at the library last week. Hmm, up to you, sir. All right, all right. I'll get the Sprout subs. Good choice, sir. Gotta watch that waist if you're gonna be hitting the beach, eh? That's how much? Just between you and me, there's a $3 off coupon in this month's Total Men's Fitness magazine. Uh, your wife Betty subscribes to that, right? Anyhow, with that, it's $19.99 even. Whoa, looks like you're maxed out on all your credit cards. Bring cash, okay? <laughs> a lot of reaction here to that, a lot of nods of recognition. Some of the ladies here, what, what did you think? When, did it strike a chord with you, that oh, kind of thing? Oh, absolutely, yes, absolutely. Why? My feeling about the whole subject is that if my health or someone else's health is going to be protected by this kind of collection of information, or if my identity or your identity is going to be protected by this kind of um, system, that's fine. I am quite offended, in, in fact, more than offended, to think that my own personal information can be collected by some unknown person out there and sold. It has a value, a monetary, it's a commercial value placed on my information. And that's the aspect that horrifies me. Mm. David Keynes, a lot of concern about that kind of scenario, isn't there? That, that, that credit companies, that, that people know an awful lot about us, too much about us, and, and they're getting to know more and more. Is that kind of information traded around the industry? Well, it's not traded now because in most cases uh, there's no access to the information. Uh, we have credit bureaus, but there's only 5,000 virtual members of credit bureaus compared with 400,000 businesses that give um, credit. It's interesting, in that scenario, he wasn't allowed to max out any more credit. But the trouble we have now is we can't prove the identity of a person applying for credit. We've now lost access to electoral rolls for identity verification, except for banks. Um, there's a problem there. When, when a person applies for credit, they sign a privacy waiver. And the person giving the credit should be able to, to check that they're dealing with the right person. And if it comes that the person moves, the only access we have now is to the white pages at present to see whether, where they've moved to if they put their telephone in the, in the new telephone book. Um, it's just getting to the stage now where if you do apply for credit, we have no way of checking so it. So you're saying it's the opposite to what we saw? Uh, well, it is in our industry. Mm. Malcolm, do you, uh, do you agree with that? Do you see it that way? I suspect uh, the truth is probably halfway between. 
Uh, one of the interesting things about uh, these kinds of industries, the private detection industry and the, and the credit industry, is that the privacy law does provide a whole string of exemptions when something is authorised by law or is, or is essentially part of a law enforcement process. And it is interesting to me that our parliaments haven't yet given such endorsement uh, to these kinds of industries to the kind of work that they do. Now that could be that parliaments haven't been asked to think about it, or it could be that the parliaments actually would like to help these industries be a bit more constrained in how they go about their business. And I'm, I'm not trying to pass judgment one way or another. What I am observing on is that sometimes changes to the law can fix these kinds of problems if they are perceived problems, and that's what we elect our representatives to think about. Hmm. What about the actual collection of information on any kind of system? Bill, I'm interested in your mm. comments on this, on the, on the system. Let's say that Brian's um, Health Connect card, which mm. is what it's, it's, okay. it's known as at the moment, mm. this idea of connecting this health yes, information. Right. Let's say that does get off the ground and mm. becomes national. Mm. Now that information would obviously be very useful to a lot of people. Mm. How mm. secure can you make it? Well, I think the problem we've got in the last 20 years is that the computer industry got commoditized. I'd be happy with it, provided, for example, I won't mention product names, but a commercial commodity off-the-shelf operating system on that computer was not used by my doctor. Because I don't care about the little card or the doctor's card. The problem we're facing now is what's called spyware, particularly with broadband connected systems broadband connected systems with spyware coming in, they simply take over that whole machine. Now what is spyware? Anything. Explain what that oh, is. Spyware is a type of nasty piece of software that gets into your computer and can monitor everything in that machine. We call it zombie software. It can in principle take over that machine. Anything you do, it can do inside that machine in your name. Imagine that happening in the case of say a doctor's surgery where that hard disk has got a lot of information on there. The problem is now we cannot trust, we can't work with those commodity operating systems. That's well known. We knew that 20 years ago. So the, 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 the future has to be to move beyond that. And the idea of hooking up commodity systems, um, I won't mention brand names, we all know them, uh, hooking those up on a network just horrified me, particularly a broadband network. And how much of that is going on at the moment? I mean, how vulnerable is the information that's being stored on doctors' computers or on our home computers or on any other computer? Oh, well, I think we've seen plenty of examples of that over the last 12 months, what's particularly happened with, with the, the major security concern in the United States now is this stuff called spyware. Seeing there, monitoring your hard disk, monitoring your keyboards, monitoring everything you do. The problem is simple, and this is where legislation may have to come in is the responsibility of those groups, the healthcare people, the banking and finance industry, to provide a safe and secure system to at least guarantee as best as possible our privacy and the privacy of that data. They cannot do that with commercial, off-the-shelf computer operating systems. To get it, get over it. Mm. Hank, are you going to do it with those systems? I, I, I agree with what's being said, but I think the sorts of uh, initiatives that we're talking about and, and certainly the work that Centrelink gets involved, we've demonstrated for over 20 years that you can maintain a absolutely secure database and protect the privacy of individuals. It's a combination of building the right systems underpinned by a legislative framework and I think the point was made before that the release of data in relation to Centrelink is on a consent basis. Mm. And obviously you're wanting to keep that information secure too because you're involved in fraud detection in addition to the other things you've talked about as well. And, and that's something that we haven't talked very much about is that the idea of what's motivating a lot of this gathering of information, why it, it is being gathered. Now Paul McKinnon, you think we should just be able to gather most things, don't you? As a, as a former policeman, don't, don't you feel that you should have access to more information in order to fight crime? Well, if I had the capacity to make the law, Sydney and New South Wales would be a beautiful place. Let's <laughs> make that clear. However, comma... I won't press you on that. One, one, of the, one of the things that concerns me, say, with the health records, if Paul McKinnon, pilot, fronts up for his 12-monthly uh, uh, medical to qualify for my renewal, and I find that I'm blind because someone else has stolen my identity and I'm now a blind person. Now that confronts me with the whole process to say that I then have to prove that I'm the real Paul McKinnon 
and the record that is prohibiting me from regaining my pilot's license is fraudulent. Now, there is no system in place that provides that level of protection, and I see that as a principal vulnerability in most things that are technically and data related. Mm. So you would like to see a central identity system? Well, it solves so many problems. Most of the concerns that people have is that the records are legitimate, the individuals who maintain them are entitled to have it. If there are any interchange processes,